Friends, as the preceding speakers have highlighted, Dr. Ashok Mitra, to me Ashokda, was certainly truly one of the outstanding figures of post-independence India. He had a remarkable mix of personal qualities. He was, of course, exceptionally brilliant, but he, ro he, 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 he wore his brilliance lightly. He was self-deprecating and had a sense of humor that would often be turned against himself. He was ideologically absolutely firm, but full of grace, charm and courtesy vis-a-vis -vis people with whom he completely disagreed ideologically. When he was a member of the parliament, one, some of his closest friends were people like Dr. Karan Singh, Ram Jait Malani, T. N. Chaturvedi and others. In fact, he narrates an incident, an, an, an incident where he had to go to Calcutta for a medical emergency while his speech was on the next day. He had to catch the evening flight. And so Ram Jait Malani offered to him that, okay, you take my time. The moment I begin to speak, you raise a point of order. And then you go on speaking. And when you finish, I shall resume my speech. That's the kind of relationship he had at a personal level with people with whom he ideologically completely disagreed. He, of course, was a person of great honesty and integrity, but that's not saying much. He was literally tortured by the thought that he could inadvertently do something which was not honest or which would violate his sense of integrity. So he was really almost religiously honest and, 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 and almost religiously with a sense of uh, integrity. He was a romantic communist, but on the other hand, the romantic communism that pushed him in directions which are somewhat adventurist and ultra-left was actually held back by his acute intellect. In fact, it was a remarkable combination. I would say an optimal combination of head and heart because the heart kept pushing him in directions which were utterly romantic and in fact which were completely ultra-left, but, but the head held it back. And likewise, the heart prevented the head, head from making him lose that optimism of the will, because quite often pessimism of the intellect might actually make you lose the optimism of the will, but that is something which his heart would never allow him to do. So he was in a, some, in, in, in a sense a peculiar and optimal combination of head and heart, and which is why he remains such an interesting thinker. Uh, of course, people have mentioned his uh, uh, involvement with the Economic and Political Weekly, his involvement with Arik Rakam, but he was also involved with the journal with which I'm involved, that is Social Scientist. He was involved with it from its very inception. Social Scientists used to organize conferences in the old days more frequently than now because of shortage of funds. But every one of those conferences Ashokda would come to. 1971, uh, Madras Christian College, there was a conference. 1974, VJTI. I remember a very important conference in 1988 uh, when the Soviet Union was on the verge of collapse on the whole Gorbachev phenomenon at the Nehru Memorial Museum. And the last of these he attended, which was very recent, relatively recent, when he was already a person requiring support to be carried around, that was in Jadapur University was about three years ago. Five years ago was his last piece that he wrote for social scientists, he used to write regularly, and that was an obituary on Kitty Menon, who was his very dear friend from their student days. I have, of course, known Ashokda for a very long time, since 1969, almost half a century, but I would not really talk much about uh, my personal knowledge of him, because I think there's an aspect of him that tends to get ignored in all such discussions, and that is his contribution to the cause of communism and the cause of left in India. We always tend to think of a person contributing to the cause of the left only to the extent that the person organizes the oppressed 
organizes the workers, peasants and so on, by taking physical risks, by suffering physical hardships. And that is basically our conception of a contribution to the left and, and, and a fine conception at that, but an incomplete one. Because I think typically societies are characterized by a multiplicity of classes, a multiplicity of contradictions, and the left has to negotiate through all that, for which what you require is theory, for which you require ideas. Oshogda's contribution to the left consisted in the fact that he brought to it a set of ideas. In fact, the 1977 left front government started with an enormous stock of ideas in a way that the two united front governments in 1967 and 69 had not. The 77 government started with a, a, a real solid stock of ideas and also there was a very important factor behind this. I'm not saying he was the only factor. He had colleagues like Arun Ghosh, Satyabrata Sen and others. And also the fact that he brought these ideas really made a difference because these ideas found a response in Jyoti Basu and Pramod Dasgupta. But the point is that he, he did bring this set of ideas and I think as a result that government achieved a number of things which are often not recognized, especially these days. One of the things it did is what one can say breaking the agrarian impasse in Bengal. This is a phrase which I take from Professor James Boyce of University of Massachusetts Amherst who wrote a book called The Agrarian Impasse in Bengal. The idea was that because of its long colonial history, Bengal had got into such a tangle that really you had had a long period of agricultural stagnation and that also was an impasse which could not be broken. The, the left front government of 77 broke that agrarian impasse. It did so in a number of ways. Of course, the stagnation of Bengal agriculture, which actually had been really quite acute, that stagnation owed partly to the fact that in the entire colonial period, there had been no public investment in irrigation or any other infrastructure relating to agriculture. There were two reasons for it. One was the permanent settlement. If you put in 100 rupees of investment, then the colonial government wanted 5 rupees of return on the 100 rupees of investment. But if you have a permanent settlement, your revenues are fixed forever. Where are you going to get those 5 rupees? As a result, there was a systematic discrimination against investment in Bengal. Then there was a misunderstanding, which was actually uh, mentioned by the Royal C uh, Commission on Agriculture in 1926, that in Bengal, you don't need irrigation. They already have too much water. The problem in Bengal agriculture is not too little water, but too much water. As a result, there had been a complete ignoring of investment in Bengal agriculture. The left front government, notwithstanding the acute, the acute resource crisis that it faced, notwithstanding the fact that the power shortage at that period was so acute that substantial resources had to be devoted to the power sector, nonetheless, enhanced investment in agriculture. Together with it, it brought about significant changes in the agrarian relations. And these changes took the form, as you know, of Operation Burger. It took the form of making sure, a very simple thing, whoever cultivates the land must actually reap the harvest. Earlier, as you know, the tenants would cultivate the land, the, 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 the landlord's men would come and take away the harvest. But very simple thing, whoever cultivates the land would reap the harvest. The harvest then is given to the landlord who must give a chit, who, who, who must give a receipt for it. And that receipt can then be used by the, by, by, by the bank against which a loan can be made to the tenant. It completely changed, these very simple measures completely changed the agrarian relations in the countryside, reducing the power of the Jodhars. And I said, the agrarian impasse was broken because of which Bengal for a while actually was the state with the West Bengal with the highest rate of growth among all states, all Indian states when it comes to agriculture. And this had its multiplier effects elsewhere. As a, as a result, there was a, an improvement, especially in the quality of life in the countryside, which is quite undeniable. But Along with it, of course, was the whole idea of panchayats. Now, panchayats are not a Marxist idea. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, you know, 
while there is a certain superficial similarity between the Panchayat and the Soviets, but nonetheless, history had so moved on that typically communism had got associated with the idea of centralization. As a result, introducing Panchayats in West Bengal, and the elections, as you know, were held after decades, was a major innovation. And actually, it was thinking which took communism outside the, 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 the confines to which it had traditionally been restricted. Together with it, Ashoka, of course, as you know, championed the whole idea of greater devolution of resources and powers to the state governments. Now, that, again, is not necessarily a communist or a Marxist idea because centralization, central planning, and so on are typically associated with uh, communist theory or thinking, at, at, at least thinking as it had developed in practice. The fact that center-state relations actually became a major plank of left thinking is something to which Ashokda made a very important contribution. And of course, it, it became important because Jyoti Babu accepted it and put forward, they, they, they put forward this novel idea that center state relations is not a zero sum game. It's not a question of states becoming powerful and center losing power as a consequence of it. The idea was that if there is greater devolution, then the totality taking the center and the states together becomes stronger. So that, you know, it's, it's, it's not that the states become stronger at the expense of the center, but the entire structure becomes stronger through the devolution of powers and resources uh, from the center to the states. It is unfortunate. I mean, Ashoka, of course, a man of great principles, uh, because of which he came into conflict, often with party discipline, and which ultimately led, because of some principle uh, uh, disagreement on the question of education policy, to his resignation from the government and the party. But that was really extremely unfortunate. In fact, it was unfortunate because that coincided also with the apogee of the fight on the center state relations. Because after that, the fight tended to go down. You now had a situation under neoliberalism when the center actually arm twisted the states through charging exorbitant interest rates to them on the loans it gave to the states uh, into falling in line. Finance commission would then come and say, we'll give you debt relief, provided you accept the following terms. And those terms were invariably neoliberal. So generally, in that struggle over center state relations, the mid 80s really marked, in some sense, a, 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 a kind of turning point. And it's a pity that Ashoka was not there at that point to carry the struggle forward. And now it has reached a point where the GST, which is a complete complete abrogation of states' rights is actually an encroachment on the constitutional rights of the states really did not uh, arouse any significant protest. As a matter of fact, all states fell in line. Jyoti referred to it that Ashokda's last days and months, he lived in the hope that we would move the Supreme Court against the GST. And when we consulted lawyers, they said, fine, you can move the Supreme Court against the GST. But a group of public intellectuals moving the Supreme Court is not going to cut much ice unless you can get some state governments also to come in. And alas, there were very few state governments who were willing to come on this at that time, even though it was was clear to every dispassionate intellectual, not just party, but every dispassionate intellectual. I have had Amartya Sen uh, say this, that, you know, how come there is no protest on GST? It's a horrible thing. That, that it was clear to everybody, but alas, there was not really much, much protest. And so Ashokda, in that sense, was very disappointed. His, his uh, ideas underlay the period in which the left and the left front government reached its apogee, as I said, in Indian politics. Jyoti Babu was offered the prime minister of the prime ministership of the country in mid 90s. As a matter of fact, however, left influence was at its zenith in the mid 80s, and that was because of this struggle, because of the fact that overdetermination, as Althusser calls it, this overdetermination, this, this, this contradiction of center state relations, which is not just a direct contradiction between the oppressed and the oppressors, is something which was championed by the
the left, and that's why the left actually came uh, to emerge as a major force in the Indian polity. Srinagar, Conclave, and so on have already been talked about. Ashokda being a romantic revolutionary, a person who, has, who also lived to see the decline of the left front government, the decline of the left internationally and nationally, and also the decline of the state struggle for, 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 for greater share of resources and powers. Being a romantic revolutionary, he would always say that, you know, we have to start again from scratch. We really have to go back to the grassroots and begin anew. I'm sure he was right in that because there are again no shortcuts to kind of, you know, for the left to revive itself. But on the other hand, one very important precondition for this revival is not just honest work at the grassroots, which of course is very important, uh, but also ideas. It is in the realm of ideas that one would actually miss the contribution of someone like Ashok Mitra to the cause of the left. Thank you.